All right, back to what we finished in the first hour. We are looking at the four views, trying to uh, resolve a problem. We have summarized our problem by stating it in what way? Justified by faith, judged according to works. View number one basically stated that as Christians, you will be judged according to your works, but that will be at the rewards judgment. You will not be judged according to your works at the final judgment, that we will not even be at the final judgment. All right. That view sounds so good and we wanted it to work as much as possible. And it it still may turn out to be the only view that's going to even be plausible. Okay. It may be the only one that we can rely on. There are problems with it, however, but I have stated now, what, 52 times now, um, that every problem, every view is going to have a problem. There is no easy solution to this. If there was an easy solution, there wouldn't be a book called Four Views. Four views. In fact, Four Views is probably being nice because there's probably about 50 views, all right? So we have to try to figure this out. We have moved on to view number two, right? View number two basically says, and I'm summarizing, you, works are necessary. However, they're not the basis and foundation for your justification. They are, in their words, the evidence of your justification. And immediately everyone should throw up, time out, throw a red flag and say, wait, 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 wait. If our definition of justification is right, justification involves What? The imputed righteousness of Christ being accredited to my account. It's there. I am declared righteous not because of anything I could do or would do. So what evidence do I need for my justification? I need The only evidence for my justification would be Christ's passive and active obedience and his righteousness. I don't need any other evidence if our definition of justification is correct. So view number two offered a new definition. And they don't mention imputed righteousness. They just mention you're not guilty. You're acquitted. Now, because you're not guilty and acquitted, you got to prove that you're not guilty and acquitted by how you live. That's okay. All right, that's base, but it's not the basis, all right? That's kind of what they try to say. I'm summarizing, but okay, we've got you know, uh, the Wednesday night sermons on there and the, this morning Sunday school will be posted. So um, you can go back and listen to all of that. So what we're doing is we're allowing the view to what? Speak for itself by allowing reading from the book itself. You know, we're offering lots of comment. And so far, what, what, uh, what's the first thing this uh, view has tried to accomplish? Yeah, the first point they're making is, you should have the first point written down. That we are not justified according to works. Now, even though he said works are necessary, he's saying, hey, we're not justified according to works. And what he said eight times, Paul basically makes this clear in his writings. He points out three times Paul does in Galatians. What we discovered is that Galatians 2.16 has been mishandled by most Protestants. We won't go back through all of that. Don't have time uh, to go through all of that. All right. So uh, that's about as that's quickest. That's that's it. I, I, that's all the review I can do. OK, and we're just going to jump back in because I don't want to repreach the first hour. I want, I want I'm trying to get this done before we're dead. OK. All right. I, I, I'm taking forever, but we got to find an answer. All right. So here we go. I'm jumping right into the book. So if you weren't here the first hour, just just ca- try to catch up. OK, or go back and listen to the first hour when you get home. All right. Here we go. Uh, He just spoke of, uh, he stated this, the only way to escape the curse is through the cross of Christ, for he took the curse upon himself that human beings deserved. Galatians 3.13, right? And remember I said, in some ways it sounds like he's undermining his own view, but we got to wait for him to possibly be setting us up. So we'll see, all right? He continues. Those who place themselves under the law and rely on circumcision for salvation cut themselves off from Christ. All right? That's a major argument in Galatians. Hey, if you're going to rely on your circumcision, if you're going to rely on this, you're cutting yourself off from Christ. You're, you're relying on a different, a false gospel, a different salvation. Now, again, please note, remember the, the, the Protestants take this idea and say, see, you don't need any works. But there has been a a teaching in the church for a long time saying, no, all Paul is saying is you don't need what works. 
those works. You don't need circumcision. You don't need Sabbath day keeping. You don't need that. But there are works you do need. That's the Catholic view, right? Well, which we'll get to. But just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning how he's going to handle this. We'll see what he does. The, the book continues. So um, I'll go back and put this all in context. Those who place themselves under the law and rely on circumcision for salvation cut themselves off from Christ, and hence their only recourse is to keep the entire law for salvation. But no one can keep the law perfectly, and thus turning to the law is a vain and hopeless endeavor. And we will all say... Amen. We will argue that no one kept the Old Testament law perfectly. So then what we would argue is the Old Testament people were saved in a different way than by law keeping. Now, he argued the way they were saved possibly was through the sacrificial system. Again, I will argue if that is true, then they didn't need any works. What works do you need to prove that you're saved if the sacrifice saved you? For them, the only evidence they would need is they offered a sacrifice. For us, if our salvation is based off the sacrifice of Christ, what works do I need to show that I'm saved other than the sacrifice? Right? See, so I think he's undermining his view, but we'll see. We'll see. Galatians clearly teaches that human works cannot justify. Now stop right there. Please note what he did. He jumped from works of the Old Testament law to now any human works. Now, is that right to do or is that wrong to do? That's going to be a, a problem of another view. For now, we don't need to worry about that. We will agree that Galatians does teach what? Old Testament law cannot save us. We can all agree on that, right? Okay. Righteousness comes by faith instead of by the law. What comes, by, uh, what comes uh, by faith? Righteousness. What comes by faith? <clears throat> Look at uh, Galatians 3. He, he cites 11 through 12. I haven't been reading all the verses he's referencing uh, because it'll take forever. I'm just, you know, if you have a problem, you can go read Galatians, but I think we're on the same page here, but we'll read this. Uh, Galatians 3, 11 through 12. But that no man is justified by the law In the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. All right? Okay, it's not as clear as, there's some other verses I probably would go to, but all right, I get that. But make sure we make this very clear. If it is true that righteousness comes by faith, let's make this very clear. If we all in this room believe righteousness comes by faith, what righteousness comes by faith? Christ's righteousness. We don't gain some righteousness because we had faith, but we place faith in the righteousness of Christ, which is imputed to our account. If that is true, then what works do I need? Because I would be declared, how righteous would I be declared? So if Bobby doesn't have enough works, does it matter? Like if you say works are, are the evidence of it, how can works be an evidence for the righteousness of Christ imputed to his account. It can't be, unless I'm going to make this argument. Righteousness was not imputed to Bobby. Righteousness was infused into Bobby. And now Bobby proves that that righteousness was infused into him by what he does. Hmm. Protestants sound a lot like Catholics. You see, it's amazing. I, I love, I, and, I, and again, maybe, maybe it's wrong. Maybe I probably shouldn't have gone to a Catholic university and work on a degree in Catholic theology and study Catholicism as much as I have. But the more you do that, the more sometimes you just have to look at Protestants as the jokes that they are. Because they talk so big and bad about how we're not Catholic, and then they turn right around and literally speak a Catholic view. And you know why they do that? Because I don't actually know what the Catholic view 
Now, why did they do that? Why would I want to study a bunch of false religion garbage? Yeah, okay. If you don't know it, you can't avoid it. True? All right, here we go. So, Galatians clearly teaches that human works cannot justify. Righteousness comes by faith instead of by the law. If that is true, I think I'm making a good argument that where he's going, it can't work. But he's giving this even though he knows where he's going. So, we got to see how, what, where the turn is. All right. Paul opposes circumcision and the desire to live under the law. For the law, instead of curbing sin, increases it. Those who live under the law, he gives a bunch of scriptures, are under a curse. Under sin, right? Everybody get the idea? If, you, if, we, if we go try to live according to the law, what's going to ultimately happen to us? More guilt. More guilt. More guilt, right? It's going to be re- revealed. Um, he says we're enslaved under the elements of the world. He says, the law exposes the wickedness of the human heart, the selfishness and self-worship that consumes every one of us. Works do not lead to the verdict justified. Works do not lead to the verdict justified. I think all of us agree, unless we got to redefine sin and redefine works. Okay. For the law opens the floodgates of sin instead of restraining sin. All right? Agreed? Yes? Okay. He says, basically, Paul states the same thing in Romans 7. Sin is a deceptive power. Uh, sin as a deceptive power takes control of the law, using it as its ally and producing even more sin. He quotes Romans 5, Romans chapter 7. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, the power of sin is the law. Arguing the law can't help. Now, what, what, what questions should we ask ourselves? What law is he referring to? Is he referring to just the Old Testament law? If he is, he can still come in and do what? These works are what prove you're saved, not those works. That's what I'm waiting to see if he's, that's how he's going to try to trick us. We'll see. In Galatians, justification is not obtained by the law, but through faith in Christ. It is not surprising then that the cross of Christ plays a central role in Galatians. Believers have been delivered from this present evil age through Christ's giving of himself over to death. There is no middle ground. Righteousness is either gained through the cross of Christ or the law. Now, what did he just say? There is no middle ground. I will argue, if you say there's no middle ground, then what shouldn't be necessary? You can't say, look, you know, Bobby, you're saved. I know you say you're saved. I know, but I got to see some evidence, man. Well, the only evidence, remember what I said, what should Bobby's response be to that? The only evidence is what Christ did. Back off. Now, that sounds like an excuse to sin. It's not. It's just making a clear statement. All right, let's continue. Those who turn to the law for justification have have had a spell cast over them that obscures the cross from their vision. The curse hanging over human beings is only removed through Christ taking the curse that human beings deserve liberating them from the law via his death. Relying on circumcision denies the scandal of the cross. For circumcision centers on the work of the human subject, so that praise goes to human beings rather than to God. Hence, Paul boasts only in the cross, while his opponents boast in their own accomplishments. Justification cannot be obtained through the law for human beings are radically sinful, needing redemption and not merely reformation. We need deliverance, not a slight makeover of our evil inclinations. All right. Seems pretty clear. So what is he driven home as much as he can? We're not justified by works. And what book has he emphasized this in so far? Galatians. Now, he's going to drive the same point home, but he's going to turn to the book of Romans. 
which is where we are supposed to be, but we'll never get back to it because Romans 2.6 has caused all these problems. Okay, all right. Now, let's see what he says here. He says, justification and works in Romans. Romans flies in the same orbit as Galatians. Justification is not obtained through works of the law. Let's go, let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Everybody there? Okay. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Stop right here. We have to ask the question, what law is Paul referring to? Is he referring to Old Testament law? But he's going to allow for some other kind of work. Right? I'm going to keep driving that point home because that, we're going to have to deal with that question at some point. Has everybody got that? He also wants us to look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Again, what law? And I will argue, if Bobby is justified without the works of the law, right, then can those works turn around and then be the evidence that either proves or disproves his salvation? I don't see how they can be. Agreed so far? All right. Again, works of law include the, uh, the boundary markers. Now, please note, what did he just say? Works of the law include the boundary markers. Remember the boundary markers he gave earlier on in his study of Galatians? Sabbath keeping, circumcision, purity rituals. Now, if he continues to say that's all he's referring to, he's going to have a way to come in and make his, his argument. And that's what we have to look out for, right? Uh, He says, uh, they include the boundary markers, and Paul is concerned about the inclusion of Gentiles as the new perspective has reminded us. Still, the fundamental complaint against the Jew is not their exclusion of the Gentiles. Paul focuses on their failure to keep the law they treasured and taught. Their moral failings are the focus of his indictment, stealing, adultery, and robbing temples showing that they, like the Gentiles, were, up, were, were uh, unrighteous despite their salvation historical advantages. They, like the Gentiles, did not seek God or do His will. I agree that when you read Romans from 1 to 3, he's going to basically conclude that who is under sin? Jew and Gentile. I do agree with that. All right, let's continue. Every mouth is shut before God because of human sin. And justification cannot be obtained by works of law, for the law discloses human sin. Righteousness is therefore available only through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, start in verse 21. Everybody there? Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all all them that believe, for there is no difference. No difference between whom? Jew or Gentile, right? Because what, what would we receive by faith? The righteousness of God, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at the time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. All right? So he says that righteousness comes through faith. Well, if that's true, how good is the righteousness I get by faith? Perfect. If it's perfect, what evidence do I need to prove that I have that righteousness? I would only need to point to Christ. That's where the, ev- that's where the evidence would have. It can't rely on me. Does that make sense? 
Now, I, I guess you, if you want to make any argument, I would just have to uh, show you that I believe. And there's no way to prove that I believe unless you're going to show that works prove that you believe and therefore they're proof of justification, which then destroys uh, everything we just said. All right. Just as we saw in Galatians, uh, and this is uh, in agreement with everything we've seen in Galatians, Jesus has satisfied God's wrath on the cross. Taking the punishment we deserved. Justification then is a gift given and received so that there is no basis for human boasting. And the offer of salvation is extended to all of humanity. Now please note, if there's no room for boasting, if there's no room for anything, then why do I need works to prove it? Let's continue. I, again, he, he's, he's not making any argument, he's not made an argument for his case yet. Everyone agree? All right. That, that mean, I just feel like I'm being set up. I just feel like, like this just gives me all kinds, of, like I just want to start arguing. None of these verses say what he says they're saying because I'm waiting. I'm waiting for what he's yeah, I, yeah, so we'll get. Yeah, 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 you know, we know it's coming. All right, but here we go. Both Jews and Gentiles are righteous in the same way by believing in Jesus Christ, not by working to obtain a reward. In Romans chapter 4, Paul brings up Abraham, right, uh, to confirm his teaching on justification. Here, the discussion is no longer on works of law, but works. Well, that's an interesting distinction. Now, remember, we've been concerned about this works of the law phrase. Now he says, wait a minute, it's no longer on works of law, but works. Now, this, this is very important if this is true, because this may cause problems for upcoming views. Let's see where he goes here. This is scarcely surprising, for Abraham did not live under the Mosaic law. Ooh, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. Everybody may want to remember this. This is going to come in very, when we get to like the Catholic view and some of the other views, this is going to be very important. If, if Abraham is justified by faith and declared righteous apart from works, it cannot be re- regarding to works of the law because Abraham lived prior to the Mosaic law. Everybody get that? And thus, uh, for Abraham did not live under the Mosaic law, and thus works of law did not fit the era in which he lived. Now, this is not to say that ethnic issues are absent from the discussion, for the role of circumcision relative to Abraham arises in Romans chapter 4, showing that one does not have to be Jewish to belong to the people of God. Nevertheless, ethnic issues are not at the forefront of Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. For here Paul addresses the matter of works and justification in general. Hence, he says, let's look at Romans chapter 4. Right? We'll read at least, we'll read a couple of verses here, starting on verse, we'll read verse 1 through 3. What shall we say then? Uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by work, he hath wherewith, where, whereof to glorify, but not before God. Verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. All right? Hence, he says in Romans 4, 2, that if Abraham did the works required for justification, he would have a reason for boasting. The term works is used in the broadest sense, here referring to what human beings do. Now, please note, he's making an argument now that when we refer to works in regards to Abraham, what works does this refer to? Any work that a human being does. That is critical. You may not understand the theological implications of that, but everybody here should be like, ooh, let me write that down 12 times. Okay? And nobody's writing it down once. Okay, everyone should write it down because this is critical to where we're going. All right? Everybody got it? Okay, yes, please, yes. All right, we'll see how well you remember this when we get later on. I'm going to say, wait a minute, how does this work? And everybody better say, Abraham was justified without works, and he lived before the Mosaic Law. So therefore, 
this could be an argument that when the Bible says we're not justified according to works, even though Paul says works of the law, it would have to involve all works. Does that make sense? Yes? All right, we'll see. Now, uh, Galatians 2.16 would still have its immediate context, which is referring to Old Testament law, but okay. All right, here we go. I'll read this phrase again, uh, this part again. The term works is used in the broadest sense, hence referring to what human beings do. Now, they do make a reference to Romans 9, 11 through 12. Let's look at it. I'm just curious. It's not ringing a bell. Not chapter 9, verse 11 through 12. Okay, I see what he's doing here. Who's he going to, uh, what two uh, children is he going to pull up as an example here? Jacob and Esau. Okay. Romans 9, 11 through 12. Say amen when you're there. Okay, here we go. Romans 9, verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, what, he, what he's making an argument is that, hey, one was declared, basically, God hated one and loved the other. He accepted one and hated the other, and it had nothing to do with their, their works because he, the, he made the choice before they were even born and before they could even do anything. Now, this is an argument for election, which some people would reject, but it does make the point he's trying to make. All right? Yes, no? Okay. And uh, when did those children live? For the Mosaic Law. Yes? No? Okay, all right. And explaining that they would provide a basis for righteous... Okay, let me go back and read this again. The term works is used in the broadest sense here, referring to what human beings do. And explaining that they would provide a basis for righteousness if they were observed. Abraham did not meet the test, however, for he lacked the necessary works before God. Romans 4.4 constitutes a a further... um, uh, Look at something. Go back to Romans 4.4. 4. When I stop that way, oh, you always get worried. You're like, wait a minute, is he getting ready to change everything that we've been teaching? Okay. I'm going to read verse 1 to 4 straight through. Just make sure I'm not confused here. All right. Everybody ready? Romans chapter 4, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof... Where, whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Okay, I see where he's going here. All right, Romans, Romans 4, 4 basically helps explain Romans 2, 2. And what, what's his argument here? If our justification hath anything to do with our work, then what would it be? If our justification have anything to do according to our works, what would it be? Look, it's open book, Romans 4, 4. Yeah, we would, we'd be owed something. In other words, we earn something, right? Okay. I don't know where Joel is. but it, 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 we could, Okay, well, wherever Joel is, Joel went home today and did like 15 things that he knows his parents wanted done, and he did them and then wanted something for it. It would be... He, he's, he, he's earning it. He did something to get it versus his parents just going home and giving him $50 for no reason. Right? Okay. So you see what Joel asked for $50 today and say that it, it would prove to them Romans 4, 1 through 4. Okay. All right. I'll give you a theological justification for getting $50. I get 25 of it. All right. All right. You get the idea? All right. Okay. Uh, uh, those who do the necessary works are like someone who works for an employer. If one does what is required, he or she receives a reward. Wages are the payment. So too, if human beings do the works God require, they will receive the rewards of justification. If If human beings keep all that God demands, they will indeed be rewarded and declared to be right before God. Now, I will stop right here, and I have to kind of make a theological argument here. Theoretically, this could be true, but it's not true practically in here if we believe in human depravity. 
Because what we would teach with human depravity is that even if we did all the works, what would be wrong? We're still guilty in Adam. We still have a depraved nature, and therefore any good work we've done would be tainted by sin. So we would argue, now this is those who believe in human depravity. Now if you're a semi-Pelagian or Pelagian, you can maybe get, get off the hook here, but we would argue that, and I'm still not convinced of semi-Pelagian or Pelagianism. I mean, you're going to have to do a lot of work. You're going to have to prove to me you, can not, you cannot sin. And since no one has yet proved that to me, I'm going to disagree with semi-Pelagianism and Pelagianism. Okay, So, um, so I do agree that in theory, they're making an argument, yes, if you could keep the law, then you would get the reward of salvation. He's not necessarily trying to get into an argument about human depravity, but I'm just saying we just need to realize that even if we kept it, we'd still be guilty. And Adam, we would still have a sinful nature, and all of our good works would be tainted by sin. All right. So um, he says, so they, uh, they will indeed be rewarded and declared to be uh, in, the, uh, in the right before God. Abraham, however, is in, 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 indicted as ungodly. And he says uh, four, five. He names a couple of, of other verses. Let's look at it. Romans four, five. Uh, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the un, uh, just justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He's kind of making an argument that that's referring to Abraham. That Abraham is ungodly, but his faith is counted for him as being righteousness. And then he goes to Joshua 24. Let's look at Joshua 24. Okay, yeah, I see what he's going to do here. Joshua 24, 2. Say amen when you're there. Mm-hmm. 24, 2. And Joshua said unto all the people... Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. What's going to argue is that at one point Abraham was what? Yeah, ungodly and an idolater. So how was he declared righteous? By faith. All right, everybody see that? Hence, righteousness is not gained by doing, but by believing. He says Genesis 15, 6 affirms this, and so does Romans 4, 3. The justification of Abraham represents the justification of the ungodly, demonstrating that righteousness is apart from works. All right, so far so good? All right, now the next part I'm going to read fast. All right, I'm not going to take it apart because I want to get to where he, I want to try to get to the, the, the turning point in his argument, okay? Because right now he's just continuing to build. What do you not need? Works. What do you not need? Works. What do you not need? Works. He's just saying it over and over and over, which is good because the Bible says it over and over and over and over. Okay. But now, how is he going to get... Come, because remember, he's, his immediate thesis was well, works are necessary. So how is he going to get to them being necessary? We'll see. So he says, now Paul introduces David as a second witness. And if you look at Romans 4, 6 through 8, you'll see this. David received the blessing of justification, which is defined in terms of the forgiveness of sins. David could not be righteous on the basis of his works, for his adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah reveal that he needed forgiveness. Nor can we say that David was justified on the basis of his post-conversion works, for the sins David committed were after his conversion. Everybody agree with that? All right. Hence, when we say that justification is apart from works, we cannot limit the works to uh, uh, pre-conversion works. Justification is apart from all works. For perfection is required and all people, even the most devoted saints, fall short in significant ways. Right? So we all fall short in significant ways. Every, everyone agrees with that. Now please note how this undermines your, where he is headed. If everyone falls short in significant ways, how can you turn around and say, your works prove it? Well, if I fall short in significant ways, maybe I don't have many works to prove it. How many works do I need to prove it? And again, we still have the the most haunting passage in the entire New Testament is when you have a bunch of people standing before Jesus in judgment saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? 
This, and they did works that I've never been able to pull off. And what did he say to them? So like, then what works are, if, if healing people, casting out demons, preaching and doing miraculous works is not evident enough, what is evidence? You say, well, evidence is loving your neighbor or doing this. Okay, well, there's lost people who are pacifists, who turn the other cheek. Well, wait a minute. So did, 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 did. See, you get yourself in a mess here. But let's see where he goes. Now he jumps to the contribution of other Pauline letters. So he's looked at Galatians. He's looked at Romans, all right? In Romans, he, he looked at uh, Abraham, and he looked at David, all right? Now he's going to say what Paul teaches is confirmed in other letters. The heart of the gospel... Um, what, uh, the heart of the gospel is confirmed in, in his other letters and his, his writings. What is of first importance is the forgiveness of sins that is secured only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fundamental need for human beings is forgiveness. What believers need is to be rescued from God's end-time wrath. And Jesus is the one who will save believers from God's eschatological wrath. All right? No problem with that? Again, this sounds like we don't need works. Paul's later letters communicate the same truth. Salvation is not secured by works, but by faith. For by grace we are saved through faith that is not of ourselves, but is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. If, humans, if human beings do the works demanded by God, that they can legitimately claim that they have fulfilled what God demanded and should receive the reward of salvation. But salvation is not received on such a basis, for human beings are dead in trespasses and sins. They carry out the desires of the flesh, follow the patterns of the world, and the dictates of the devil. Thus, salvation cannot be on the basis of works. It is granted by God as a gift, as a witness to his astonishing love. We find the same teaching in Titus 3, verses 3 through 7. Human beings are radically evil, as is witnessed by our cruelty towards and hatred of one another. But God has showed his extraordinary kindness on us. He has saved us through Jesus Christ, Paul emphasizes again that humans are not saved by works. In fact, his definition of works here is works done in righteousness. Human works don't pass muster. They don't meet the bar of God's righteous standard. And we know just what Paul means from the previous verses. Human beings have lived wickedly and foolishly pursuing sinful desires so that they have failed to do God's will. Still, still... Human evil is not the last word, for God has poured out his mercy on sinners. He has showered his grace on those who trust in Jesus Christ, renewing and regenerating them through the Holy Spirit. Hence, those who belong to Jesus are justified not on the basis of their own work, but by virtue of the saving work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. He's simply emphasizing the same point, right? Here's his conclusion. When we consider the role of works and final justification, we must begin where Paul does. Human beings cannot be justified or saved on the basis of their works, for they are sinners and fail to meet God's standard. They need to be rescued, redeemed, and reconciled. They need to be justified and saved. They need to be cleansed and washed to be adopted into God's family. Justification must be apart from works, for human beings do not, cannot do what God demands. Hence, their righteousness is not in themselves, but in Jesus Christ, their Lord. Everyone should say, Amen. Amen. Now, here's what we were trying to get to. He spent a, you gotta be, you gotta respect what he did there, right? He spent a long time basically undermining his final argument, in my opinion. Right? What have we seen now over and over and over? How are you justified? By faith. What do you get by faith? Righteousness. Whose righteousness? Well, how, how good is that righteousness? So therefore, what do I need? Nothing. What do I have? Everything. I have God's righteousness. So do I need something else to prove I have it? The only proof I need is look to Christ. There's the proof. I can't do anything to prove that I have it. Unless I'm, unless I'm arguing that I was infused with it. But if it's just imputed, it doesn't do anything. It just changes my legal standing before God. It doesn't change me. Does everybody remember? I know some people don't like to hear that, but that's the Protestant teaching. All right. Now, guess what the next, next, cha- next point is? What's point number one? Justified apart from works. Guess what point number two is? 
Justification by works. Oh, my head. Oh, my head. All right. Here we go. And guess where he's going to turn us to? Romans 2, where the problem started. I do, I, I do admire him because that's where the problem started for me. So he's going to take us back to where the problem started. And I told you it was a problem. Okay, this is what makes me mad when I listen to other pastors preach on Romans 2. Ah, it's no big deal. It's all good. We're done in 34 minutes. And I'm like, no, it's a problem. Yeah, yeah Paul didn't mean that. Yeah. That's, that, that's uh, yeah. South, Southside did that on their little sermon on Romans 2. Yeah, Paul didn't really mean that. He didn't, he didn't really mean that. Okay, thank you for telling me. Thank, thank you. Yeah, just skipped right on. Done. And I'm like... Paul didn't mean that. I, I wanted to call that pastor and say, when did you talk to Paul? Do you have, a, do you have his phone number? Because I'd like to call him. Because I don't think you talked to Paul. And I don't think you know how to read. Okay? No. Okay. That, that probably wouldn't be nice. But, all right. Here we go. Justification by works. Romans chapter 2. Works in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. The previous discussion seems to be the end of the story, but there are more verses to this song than the first one. I agree. He's saying basically he's creating this like a song, and the first verse of the song is justified apart from works. However, verse number two, justified by works. Paul disavows justification by works in some text. But then in other verses, he teaches that we are justified by works. Paul's teaching about works in Romans 2 is remarkable. I said that. Right? Remember I said this, this is crazy. Right? For this text is nestled within Romans 1 verse 18 through Romans 3 20. Where Paul affirms that no one is justified by works. I agree. In 2 6, everybody got Romans 2 6 open? What does Romans 2 6 say? We're going to be judged according to our deeds, all right? Paul articulates the thesis for all of 2 6 through 11. So he says 2 6 is the thesis statement, 6 through 11 is the full statement. And what's the thesis? God's going to judge you to your works. Then 6 through 11 articulates it. Namely, that God will repay each one according to his works. Verses 7 through 10 unpack the meaning of this statement, all right? Um, an achaistic arrangement, all right? A chiasm, remember, I've talked about that structure, that little book, booklet that the Pierces brought me right here. Okay, this is, this is uh, using this idea of a chiasm uh, and showing, like they're trying to turn the whole Bible into a chiasm. It's crazy hermeneutical. It, this thing gave me a, a, I think I had a seizure reading this thing. Okay, but he's going to say it's in that same structure. Whether you understand the structure or not, it, 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 I can say here's the chiastic structure. Here, look, and I can show you how it works and you'll think I'm really smart, but we, we don't need to, I don't need to prove that I'm smart or, or anything. What we need to do is try to figure out what in the world Paul's doing. I don't care about the structure as much as I care about what. What, what do I need to know about judgment? Right. All right. And now they're going to he does this thing where he's going to give you in a chiastic structure. Each section is assigned a letter like A, B, B and then B, C, A. So I'm not I'm going to try to ignore some of the way he's structuring it. I just want you to get the content, not so get caught up into the structure because I'd have to teach you how this works. All right. It's interesting. But for our purpose here, I don't want to. Get distracted. Does that make sense? Okay. If you're reading this, you'll see he's placing it in the structure. I think Sarah's got the book back there, right? So you see the structure, but, you know, you go to her house and she'll teach you the structure. Okay, all right. Here we go. Um, He's going to work through this. Verses 7 through 10 is going to unpack the meaning of this statement. He will grant eternal life to those who seek glory and honor and incorruptibility by patiently enduring and good work. Everybody see that in Romans 2, 7? All right. Conversely, he will pour out his wrath and anger on those who pursue evil. Everybody see that in 2.8? 
Those who carry out evil, whether they are Jew or Greeks, will experience affliction and distress. Everybody see that in 2.9? But the one who does what is good will enjoy glory, and glory honor, and peace. Everybody see that in 2.10? All right. Paul is certainly not talking about rewards above uh, and beyond e uh, above and beyond eternal life here. That was my argument, remember? Remember I said, wait a minute, Paul and Romans 2, we can't say that all Paul is saying is that, hey, you're going to be judged according to your works for a reward. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about punishment. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about hell. Right? I, I will stand by that. I don't know how you can read that and not say that that's what, that's what it says. Right? Um, verse 7 demonstrates without a doubt that eternal life is at stake and whether one does good or evil. I, I believe 2, 7 makes it clear. Indeed, in the context of Romans 1 through 3, the entire issue is whether one will escape the final judgment on the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Look at Romans 2, 5. Right? Yes? Everybody agree? All right. The doing of the law is not optional, but necessary on the day that God judges the secrets of human beings. For the doers of the law will be justified. Everybody see Romans 2.13? I'm in 3.13. Makes absolutely no sense. Okay. All right. For uh, not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Okay. All right. All right. Is that 16? It is 13. Okay. All right. 2.13. I, I, I may have said 2.16. I apologize. All right. Okay. Now, so far, so good? All right. Now, Romans 2, 26 through 27, that's the heading for this next section. All right, we've got about five minutes and we'll stop, right? Here we go. Many interpreters, of course, think that Paul speaks hypothetically in Romans 2, 6 through 10, since the final conclusion of his argument is that no one is justified by works of the law. Right? So this is the argument that some make. This is all hypothetical. Paul doesn't really mean that's how you're going to be judged. It's a hypothetical argument. Again, I, I would love that interpretation, but why does that interpretation not work? What's the number one reason it doesn't work? Well, the number one reason it doesn't work, just make sure you have this down, is because all it would do is get you off the hook for Romans 2. It doesn't fix all the other verses that says, those who do good get what? Eternal life, those who do e evil get what? Damnation. It, it only gets you off the hook for Romans 2. That's what the guy at Southside, he completely ignored the rest of the Bible on the subject. He, he basically acted like, hey, the only time we're ever told we're judged according to works is Romans 2. It's hypothetical. Now, it's noon. Go eat lunch. You know, Golden Corral probably has a buffet going, so everybody head over there and enjoy yourself. So get ready. Like, no, hey, Hey, buddy, uh, there's a bunch of other verses that talk about judgment according to works. So maybe we cancel the buffet and we stay in church and figure this out. I said that, but the, the sermon still ended. He couldn't hear me for some reason. Probably because the sermon is old and, you know, but even if I was there, I'm assuming I would have been outvoted. Okay. Yes? Okay. All right. Such a reading resolves the tension between the two texts. I do agree it resolves tension. Now, please note, and we're going to have to stop at this point. You always have two options when dealing with the text. Resolve the tension that the text may create or satisfy a correct exegesis of the text. Do you want to satisfy the tension, how it makes you uncomfortable, you don't like it, or do you want to satisfy a correct exegesis of the text? What do you really want? Now, you need to be honest, because I know what some of you really want. You want what? Satisfy the tension. Now, I'm going to be blunt. If that's what you want, this is what you should do. Close your Bible. Hand it to someone who cares. Stop claiming to be a Christian and go find a new religion. Because you don't care about truth. 
if you want truth, guess what you're going to do? Don't give me something that resolves the tension. Give me a correct exegesis of the text, even if it leaves me perplexed, confused, and worried that I don't know what I believe anymore. And what have I constantly given you? I can't say mine's correct, but I've constantly given you an exegesis of the text that leaves you confused and not knowing what you believe, okay, right? But, all right? Because you can't sometimes, you can't just arbitrarily remove the tension. You can't just arbitrarily do that. That's not how, that's not how theology works. That's not how truth works. Agreed? Right? This is what he says. Such a reading resolves the tension between the two texts, but it fails as satisfying exegesis because of what Paul writes in 2, 26 through 29. All right, now we'll have to stop right there. We'll come to 2, 2, 26 through 29. All right, let's stop right here. Okay, so what do we have so far? We have a view that is trying to tell us that works are necessary. Yes? However, they started with what point? We're justified apart from the works. And we went through, what books did we go through? Galatians, we went through Romans, and we went through other writings of Paul. And it seems to be a consensus, a constant teaching of Paul, what can you not be justified by? Works. What are you going to get by faith? Righteousness. All right. Now, he understands, though, his view is going to require works in some way because this is his view. And so what's point number two in his view? Justified by works. And where is he taking us? Romans chapter 2, which leads to all the problem. And why does Romans chapter 2 lead to a problem about justification? Because it seems to imply clearly what? When Bobby stands before God, how is he going to be judged? According to works. If he did good, what happens? If he does bad, hell. That's what Paul seems to imply. And one attempt is to do what? Paul didn't mean it. It's just a, he's a hypothetical. He's creating a scenario for you to like, oh man, I'm going to work. I'm going to work for it. And then Paul's going to go, you can't. All right? I like that answer. The only problem is, what's the main problem with that? It doesn't satisfy the rest of scripture. Every scripture that speaks of judgment says judgment is on the basis of what? Works. Everybody got that? Every, even Jesus himself said that. Those who do good get the resurrection of life. Those who do evil, condemnation. All right? I can't just get, if Paul says it's hypothetical, then I gotta say Jesus was saying it was hypothetical. And if I start reading now statements as hypothetical that the text from a linguistic standpoint doesn't sound hypothetical, that means I've got to reread everything as possibly. Maybe the flood was hypothetical. Maybe creation was really hypothetical. Like, like what, what, what's not, how do I read what's hypothetical? Usually there's something in the language that says, I think he's, this is hypothetical. There's nothing in the language. So we're going to have to see what he's, if, if he's going to go with the hypothetical argument, he seems to be against it. So what is he going to do? Well, we already know where he's ultimately going to head. Yes, Bobby, you are justified apart from the works of the law. However, Bobby... You are justified by works. How are you justified by works? At your final judgment, you better have enough works to prove you are justified. Which argues what's necessary for my salvation? Works. Which seems to be, I don't know if that's the way to resolve it. All right, we'll, finish, we'll, we'll hopefully finish this view tonight. Any questions? Please ask if you have them, because there'll be 9,000. Because if, if you ask and answer now, then I don't have to spend all afternoon answering all the email questions. Because y'all never have questions, and everyone else in the world does. Because okay. trust me, I'll get, I'll get 900 questions before I come back tonight. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I'm going to just start responding. My, you just need to come to my church, because my people don't have questions, because I teach so good. So maybe you should listen to my sermon again. No, I don't think that's the issue. I just want to go home. All right. Okay. Here we go. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. Lord, we are 
seeing how this person is making an argument about how to resolve Romans 2.6. Lord, I just pray the main takeaway from this hour is that your word clearly seems to teach all of us that we're justified apart from works. But Lord, we realize that there is a tension here. There is a tension here in Scripture, and I pray that we would want truth, not simply to make the tension go away. If we do not want truth, Lord, then, then we, we shouldn't even be pursuing you or pursuing your word. I pray that we would do everything in our power to understand this view before it's finished. Hopefully we'll all be back tonight and we we'll, can come to a satisfying conclusion on this view and move on to the final two. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...